Okay. So, okay. So next, uh, the presentation will be given by Charles Greg uh, from the University of Malta, and he's going to talk about uh, solid cube ground station using phased uh, array beam spheres. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's one of the first, the worst times to present in the day. <laughs> at, at this time, everyone is like, okay, okay. So, the purpose of my presentation today is twofold. First of all, I'd like to give you a brief update on the progress of the University of Malta in terms of the pocket cube we are developing. And uh, secondly, most um, more importantly, I would like to speak a bit about my area of research, which is basically um, building of the ground station um, in a somewhat different fashion because in, in our research, in my research, I am using um, the concept of beam steering. Okay, so. First of all, um, we are a small country, for who doesn't know Malta, it's only a country of 40 kilometers <laughs> by 20 kilometers. Um, we were speaking about Perth being small, this is one quarter the size of Perth. Um, we have one university, and this is our first mission, space mission as a country. In fact, last year, <coughs> finally, um, we've drafted our first national space policy. Um, in May as well, Malta has signed the outer space treaty, so finally we are uh, becoming part of this world. And uh, as a university, uh, we are carrying out a number of um, uh, projects and research areas in order to build our pocket cube. UOE, UOM BSAT-1 is a 1P, we're going with a 1P pocket cube, um, designed by the astronomics group at the University of Malta. Um, and my colleague, Mark, is sitting in the audience, is the coordinator of this group. Um, we're aiming to have an amateur satellite status, and basically we're, we're developing a low-cost lab in space concept um, with a very tight budget, um, with validation of various designs for future missions. Originally, the idea was to launch in 2018. Um, however, um, it will not be possible to launch this year, um, largely due to um, budget constraints, um, because a lot of things are being developed in-house and unfortunately students graduate, move on, and certain aspects of submodules need to be started all over again or continue the form. Four main missions here, um, primarily to serve as a technology demonstrator for the University of Malta. All designs, um, all design of all modules, even some specialized equipment is being done in-house. Um, we're collaborating with a local company Blue Five Labs as technology providers. Uh, we're collaborating with the University of Birmingham. I believe um, Jonathan was, was here last year speaking about um, the development of a, an ionospheric sensor, um, which, which we will probably be hosting as our scientific payload. And finally, we're, we're, we would like to contribute to the amateur radio community by giving, sharing the data from our scientific payload mission and uh, with the general amateur community. Um, the scientific payload, as I was saying, is developed by the University of Birmingham. It's an impedance probe for ionospheric sensing of electron, electron density. And it is primarily used um, to improve ionospheric and space weather models. We're intending to take that data and put it in a central repository together with other telemetry, which can be shared amongst the community um, for better uh, prediction of um, uh, HF and other, and other band propagations um, uh, and, and be guided better. Okay, in so far as requirements are concerned, we have a number of requirements here that we need to work within in terms of constraints. First of all, this is a 1P, so we restrict it to 250 grams, 5 by 5 by 5. Um, attitude determination control, which we need both for the payload um, 
and also in terms of communications. Um, we need uh, clean spacecraft in terms of magnetic field, which is required for the payload, for the impedance probe. Um, orbital position and timing, which hopefully, I mean, the goal is to have on board measurement there. However, this is a subject we're still debating and worst case scenario we, we, we drag that from the ground. Altitude, we, are, we have a bit of a constraint in terms of altitude. I mean, we know what the altitudes are. However, for the impedance probe to function, it has to be somewhere in the top side atmosphere. Um, because if not, uh, the measurements would not be would not be optimal. Orbital light, we have been speaking about earlier on today as well. I mean, the max is 25. And we're not building something that is intended to last 25 years. But at least we'd like to, uh, it's likely to last two years at minimum in order to, uh, for the amortization period of the payload to be achieved. In terms of bandwidth, I mean, this is an amateur satellite at the end of the day, so the maximum uh, bandwidth we can get for this type of uh, function is 20 to 25 kilohertz, and, and that's, that's most. Just sharing a bit with you um, our mass allocation in general, okay? So as you can see, the majority there from 250 grams, the, the biggest um, part goes for the structure, um, followed by the EPS, ADCS, and going down, I mean, the payload on its own is just five grams of the total <coughs> of the total mission. Okay, okay. In terms of power budget, I mean this is a simplified version obviously. But um, we're working on we're working on a conservative power budget of an average power of two to six uh, milliwatts, yeah. And um, eighty five percent eighty five milliwatts of that is definitely uh, will be used for communications. And the comms is definitely the highest consumer in terms of peak power <coughs> um, in the region of 1,600 uh, milliwatts um, at most. Um, however, due to this constraint, um, we're trying to, especially from a design perspective of the communications module, to try to save as much power as possible. In fact, in a block diagram, I'll pop quickly on screen soon. Um, we, we, we have designed an infrastructure which uses more than one transceiver in order to have a low power transceiver on standby, which will wake up the whole board when required in order to save power. One of the starting points for us, I mean, this whole project started two years ago. Um, one of the starting points from a communications perspective is, is certainly the link budget which I've put on screen there graphically just to, to give a better representation. I mean, on screen, we're taking the assumption that we're, for uplink, we have uh, an uplink of 53 dBm, which is 200 watts. Obviously, we can go higher than that should we need to. We can go up to 400, according to, to the, our license. Um, <coughs> and from, uh, from a downlink perspective, we're, we're looking at um, 27 um, DBM on the satellite, um, which is 500 milliwatts of power. A valid point I like to mention is that I mean, uh, typically there are various ground stations, uh, but a typical Yagi system will be something around 60 DBIC. Um, the goal of the ground station operating with a phase array, there are a number of goals, but one of them is certainly to try and improve um, on the gain of the ground station antenna. As a result of our workings, we'll, we're using a margin of 10 dB, which considering what we're trying to do here, um, we find to be, to be adequate and fair. And the sensitivities that are required are minus 93 dB on the spacecraft and minus 117 dB on the ground, according to our calculations. And in our assumptions, we're assuming that um, uh, the worst case scenario in terms of slant, slant angle is 15 dB. Okay, in terms of communications, I mean, there are a number of things that are being done. <coughs> um, uh, practically everything is being designed in-house, including attitude generation and control. Um, but I'm going to focus more on the communications. In terms of communications, we have three main areas, three ba main, basically three students um, who are working on, on different areas. 
um, including myself. The first is we're developing an SDR hardware platform um, with a custom design boy. Second is um, designing an SDR software stack. And uh, the third area, which is my responsibility, is building a ground station uh, with a phased array using beam steering. So some quick notes on the hardware platform. Um, designed by my colleague, uh, Oliver Vassallo. So from a receiver perspective, um, it, it appears we're going to use subsampling ADC for lower data rates in the FPGA. Um, we're going to use pulse width modulation, a pulse width modulation DAC. Um, okay, then we, we're going to use an analog front end in terms of the IQ, the modulation and modulation to reduce the computational power. Circular polarization that we're going to need. Um, and what we're going to do there is basically we're going to use um, two dipoles um, to transmit uh, with, with circular polarization. Um, one of the reasons we want to do this is because should one antenna um, fail for some reason, uh, we still have added redundancy and be able to recover that because we will have a ground station with circular polarization. And from a processor perspective, um, we're going to use a very small package, it's a 9 by 9 millimeter, which packs into it a Cortex M4 processor, an FPGA and a smart card, um, all together in that, in that package. All right. With regards to, yes, and this is the block diagram. It's a bit small, but I guess we'll be sharing these, these presentations at some point in time. Um, so this is the block diagram of the hardware we've been speaking about, as you can see. And um, we have the scientific payload connected to one of the dipole mm -hmm. antennas, which will also be used as for the impedance probe. Um, and we have the second uh, dipole, which we're going to use there with a phase shift of 90 degrees um, to achieve circular polarization. As you can also see, we have another um, transceiver there, um, which will the, the purpose is to have that always um, in, in standby mode to awaken uh, the system when, when required and save on power. All right, um, then we have the SDR software stack, which is the second area in terms of communications, um, being designed by my colleague as well, Aaron Abela. <coughs> we are intending to, to use a QPSK modulation scheme the synchronization, carrier synchronization scheme that my colleague has selected is Costas Loop. Um, FPEX 25 will be used. And um, uh, the, FEC, the FEC scheme is, is, at this point in time, quite a cyclic LGPC. We think um, my colleague is, 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 his conclusions will be innovative there, I mean, for a number of reasons, um, uh, which, I have li which we have listed there. Um, I mean, there are other conventional ways of, of doing this. Uh, however, um, the result of the research um, of the group has been that um, this is an innovative way of, of doing it, and we are going to use this scheme. Okay, so um, my area now. Um, the ground station. Um, this is my area of research. I've just started recently in July. Uh, 2017, so don't be too hard on me in the end. <laughs> I'm a newbie. Um, there are various objectives of this, of why we have decided to do this. Um, I mean, first of all, we are going to communicate um, only in, in using the UHF band. We are not going to use a different band for uplink and downlink. Okay, we're going to use um, half duplex mode for, for UHF. So that kind of makes it simpler to work with to a certain extent. Um, in terms of objectives, I mean, I'm planning to, we're, we are actually <coughs> doing research on phase array beam steering for communication on the lower UHF. I mean, phase arrays is used a lot, but it's used mostly in radar systems, military systems, etc., on higher frequency bands. So our purpose of research here is to try and bring the concept down to a much lower frequency, which is the lower part of the UHF band at center frequency of 45. 
Um, we want to try and reduce the cost because phase array systems are typically very expensive to manufacture. And as I said before, we're on a very tight budget. And uh, certainly, we do not have too much money to spend here on this. Um, another objective is obviously to collaborate with, uh, with, with University of Malta students in general from other faculties uh, because there are a number of other ongoing radio initiatives within the university. Uh, testing and performance evaluation. And finally, the creation of a central repository because we would like to share the results of the telemetry and um, ionospheric data with the general community. Now, why did we go for a phased array ground station instead of a traditional um, uh, azimuth and elevation rotation system, uh, which is standardly used in, in, in various applications? Um, for four main reasons, I'd say. First of all, um, from a performance perspective, we'd like to try and achieve a bit more of gain, if possible. Um, and from a performance perspective, perspective with a phased array we can we have <coughs> interference suppression um, uh, possible with marine capabilities. Um, from a resilience point of view, the site we have identified most is a very sunny and windy country. Um, uh, typically we have gusts of wind six four six four seven on the Beaufort scale. It's normal. It happens all the time. Um, we've identified a site which is quite prone to wind. So we reduce the risk if we have a, a phased array with no mechanical parts. Um, this will not be attended all the time, so we will be reducing the risk. Also, even if one of the elements has to fail, um, uh, then the concept of graceful degradation um, applies where the array will continue to function whilst it will still will, will have impaired capability, but it will be still continue to function um, instead of being completely offline. High speed steering for us is another advantage. We can rapidly scan and, and understand where the position of the satellite is, <coughs> even if we have uh, not complete information of where the satellite is, especially in the beginning when it is launched. And more so, mission scalability, which is probably the most important point why we have decided to go along this route. First of all, the um, scientific payload, the, origin, the intention was to have a number, to have a constellation of, um, uh, of these sensors, which would allow for a better result set to be obtained. And uh, secondly, um, even when it comes to launching, um, perhaps in the future, I mean, today we've, we've been speaking a lot about clustering in general, but when we come to eventually want to, to launch more, more than one satellite, one uh, PicoSat at the same time, uh, obviously a, a phase that I will allow us to do that instead of needing multiple setup of different antennas for every uh, unit that we would like to try. So that is, perhaps we may not need it now, but from a scalability point of view, it will help make our ground station future-proof for the years to come. What are the main challenges? The main challenges are um, First of all, it is a relatively low frequency. Um, we're speaking about the 70 centimeter band here, so a half wavelength is still 35 centimeters, which makes certain, um, for an array, makes the reproduction of certain elements um, a bit tricky, because having hundreds of elements with 35 centimeters is, is difficult to manufacture. Um, more so from a synchronization perspective, all elements um, need, all, all, all modules need to be synchronized and share, share the same clocks. Um, we have the challenge of mutual coupling here, uh, of antennas. Another challenge of phase arrays in general is the field of view. I mean, at best, theoretical best is 120 degrees field of view. That's all the array can see um, with one face. So, I mean, 120 degrees does not always serve the purpose. Sometimes you may need full hemispherical coverage. So that's, that's another challenge that we have there. Um, finally, another one, calibration, because no two parts, despite good quality control, will be, will be the same. So we will have to uh, calibrate significantly all the, all the different uh, shift phase shifters between them. And most of all, it's the cost. Back to the cost. I mean, all these things give rise to higher costs, make life more complicated. So. Whilst we'd like to do this, at the same time, we'll have to find, do this with, with, with a very limited budget. 
So first of all, what we've been doing in the last months is we've identified the exact place. And this is our university here, as you see. And the spot in red is precisely on the roof there is where we'll be installing our antennas. We made a site survey with, um, with a total station. Uh, the goal was to see what, in reality, what, uh, what the visible horizon is. And it was quite good because, I mean, when we spoke about link budget, our link budgets were based that at least we can see 15 degrees. <coughs> um, in reality, for three quarters of, of um, azimuth, we, have, we, have, we can see above three degrees, which is good, good enough for our purposes. Um, and that waste, worst case scenario, um, where there is a building which is slightly higher than us, for a small piece, it's 10 degrees, which is still good enough for our purposes. One of the main dilemmas, if you want to put it this way, of what we've, from a research perspective, is the decision as to whether we want to do analog beamforming or digital beamforming. So, for perhaps not everybody may be, may be so familiar, in analog beamforming, we're saying that we will vary the phase and amplitude um, for every element via an analog component. Whereas, and we don't have one signal converted to IF and baseband or RF, so basically we only need um, one, one SDR at the end of the day. Um, whereas with digital beamforming, we're going to do all this phase and amplitude at a digital level. Um, and to do so, we'd need a capability of a DAC and ADC at every different antenna element, which obviously raises the cost significantly. Now, digital beamforming is preferred um, because with digital beamforming, having the capability of an SDR per element, we can decide to track multiple <coughs> objects at the same time. And whilst we, whilst we, we are conscious of the fact that the cost is, is it's expensive to do so. What we have been trying to do is try and leave very John. The efforts of other colleagues, because we're building our own SDR at the end of the day on board for the satellite. So what we've been trying to do is try to see whether we can take that hardware that we're building and actually reuse it on the ground um, to, and replicate it because the cost of reproducing it is low. Um, I mean, as an estimate, um, it will cost us anything between 50 and 100 euros, I'd say, much. Yeah? Um, to, 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 to reproduce an SDR, which is, which is reasonable. Um, and we'll try to do it, we'll try to reuse this module that we are creating. Um, however, um, we have realized that this is not going, probably not going to be possible to use this because the selection of hardware on board has been selected in a particular way. I mean, we have a, we're speaking about a 1P here. We cannot pack uh, all the things that, and power that we need there. Um, FPGAs um, have to not consume more than a certain amount of power. Um, so the speed and processing capability of the FPGA is uh, also lower, which is not necessarily serving the same purpose we needed for the ground. So long story short, what has happened here is we've tried to reuse um, from a research perspective, the module that we were creating for the satellite, however, it was not possible. So what we've decided to do is, for this point in time, keep the concept of an array because that still allows us flexibility um, to, to grow in the future from a constellation perspective, but to do analog, be analog beamforming and just have one SDR um, drive the entire suite of, of elements. We believe that at this point in time, it's a fair compromise, keeps the cost lower, at the same time allows us to, to make inroads with our beam steering initiatives. This is a simplified block diagram of what we're planning to do here. So as you can see, um, we have a number of elements which, which will be repeated according to how many elements we need. The idea here is to use the same topology for both transmit and receive in, in principle. Um, with, with the obvious differences 
um, when required. So what we have here is basically we have a number of phase shifters and a number of attenu attenuators. And through that, we are planning to um, have a beam forming processor, uh, which we will be building, which will basically control the different weights by, by varying both amplitude and phase through the use of these two devices. Um, and as you can see, we have, we have um, one, one SDR there for transmit and receive. Um, we are currently researching on which best device to use there. Um, so this is a high level block diagram of what we're planning to do there. Okay. With regards to elements, which element will we use for the antenna? Uh, there are a number of elements. I mean, we also have a number of constraints. They have to be cheap and easy to build because we'd like to <coughs> have a significant number of elements um, at play there. Probably it will either be a dipole or a patch antenna that we will use, okay? I mean, we can use an array of Yagi's, which in reality is another array in itself, or even helicals. I've seen somebody, I've seen a picture today of somebody who was using, I believe it was you guys, no? Um, uh, from Nepal, was it? Yeah. There was a picture of a helicopter. Um, however, it will probably be dipoles or patch antennas because they are easy to reproduce. Something else we are researching mm -hmm. on is <coughs> through another um, faculty we have in the university. Um, they are, there's a PhD student there working on a project. <coughs> uh, M1, who is working on a project and developing a tightly coupled fractal um, octagonal phase there and then as well it's it's in it's being developed for use on the lower ranges of the SKA project um, if you look at the picture this is the result of her work here um, which is basically a set of antennas this is a printed antenna it is uh, a set of three elements and uh, depending on the configuration um, it can use for he um, horizontal or vertical um, format to achieve cross polarization there as well. Now, this is something that has been developed quite significantly. It's easy to reproduce, it's cheap. So, what we're trying to do is um, make some tests and make some research to see whether we can actually reuse this element as our antenna element in our ground station. Um, from a technical specification, it, it on, on paper it can be done because. Um, uh, 45, it, this antenna um, handles well the frequency that we would like to do. Obviously, it's difficult, different specifications, it's ultra wideband, and it has a restricted field of view because the maximum it can do is 90 degrees. However, um, uh, the technology is already there, it's in house. So, going back to right in the beginning, one of the scopes of this project is to collaborate between ourselves. So, we're trying to find ways maybe we can get this um, to work. Um, with something which is quite significantly developed. A bit about array geometry. So basically what we want to do here is we want to um, track our, sat our satellite coming in um, from north to south or south to north um, three times a day. Um, well, in overhead pass twice a day, but we'll try and Excuse me. Yeah, um, this is uh, my last slide. Um, so what we're planning of doing here is to have three phases, okay? Um, one which will be used in the majority of time. However, when the satellite is at extreme angles, then we will shift from one phase array, uh, from one phase uh, plane array to another one, in order to get the maximum signal. <coughs> okay. And as a conclusion, um, to date what we've done is we've done a number of exercises, um, link budgets, sensitivity requirements to see um, what is good and what works for us and what not. We've made the site survey, established the exact place where we're going to operate. We've concluded that the radio comms module that we're developing in-house is, is realistically, it's not possible to reuse it um, for the transmit and receive modules. And we will certainly use 
um, analog beamforming. The next steps for us are now simulations to decide exactly on the array elements type we will be using, um, the initial prototyping, uh, selection of phase shifters and components, because now we want to start the actual build of it, and also coordination with um, University of Birmingham, then again to understand the exact requirements now um, for, the, for the impedance probe um, for the scientific mission. And finally, um, as we mentioned today as well, I mean, we'd like to start the exercise of the satellite coordination exercise because that takes a while. So hopefully by the time that we would have finished all this project, we'll have our frequency allocation and be good to go. So yes, so thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, if anyone would like to ask me something, I know I'm, I'm exact on time, but in case I can, can go check later. Yes, sir. No, no. Um, uh, what I meant was that in, in the selection of the uh, antenna element type, it could be dipoles, it could be patch antennas, but one element type could actually be a Yagi in itself. So have an array of Yagis. Probably it will be a linear array. Probably, but it is unlikely we will go for that type of topology. All right, first of all, um, my thesis, my project is at least till 2020. Okay. <laughs> so mathematically, it's 2018 plus two, and there you go. Um, uh, what will happen over that um, is, is, I don't know. Um, I will probably still be around because I do this because I like to do it. I'm actually probably, the, no, I'm not sure if it's, this is true, but probably I am the, the only non only person who does not make work on this type of thing as a for a living. I actually um, my profession is in the financial services industry, um, but I am uh, an engineering student, so I'm planning to stay. So it probably be myself. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.